Hey, Foothills, we have made it to chapter 10 of 1 Samuel. And today we're beginning at a, a pivotal moment in the history of all of Israel as the prophet Samuel is going to anoint Saul to be king over the nation. We read in chapter one that Samuel took the flask of oil, he poured it on his head, kissed him and said, has not the Lord anointed you a ruler over his inheritance? And this is great. It's a really big deal, but it's pretty stinking anticlimactic. I mean, Samuel does this to Saul and they're alone on this mountain and they look around and nothing physical, nothing really has changed. In fact, Saul's about to ask Samuel, now what? And I bring that up because we can have God call us to do something and it's really big to God and to us. And we have this picture because of the movies that the mountains, or rather the clouds are gonna part, the sun is gonna shine down, the animals will start singing. But often it's a lot like this, where there's nothing really significant that you can point to and see as different, but you know that everything's different. And so let, let's see what happens here uh, in verse two. Saul says, uh, now what? Where do I go? And it, Samuel says, when you go from me today, then you will find two men close to Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin at Zelzah. And they will say to you, the donkeys which you went to look for have been found. We see the first thing that God does is says, he, he tells Saul, I'm taking care of your business. I'm taking care of the things that occupied you before I gave you this call on your life. And you see, the call of God does not come with extra hours in the day. It doesn't come with some giant boost in your bank account once he, he anoints you to do something. Often what it means is we're going to have to give up something. And God here is demonstrating as he does so often in our lives that, hey, where I call you, I will provide. I'm going to work on your behalf. I'm going to take care of your business. But God goes on and does more. We read in verse three that Samuel will go further from there and you will come as far as the Oak of Tabor and there three men going up to God at Bethel will meet you. One carrying three young goats, another carrying three loaves of bread and another carrying a jug of wine and they will greet you and give you two loaves of bread which you will accept from their hand. So God first takes care of Saul's business and now he's taking care of his daily needs, literally his daily bread right there. God does that for us. If he places a call on your life, he's not gonna lead you to a place where you're not gonna be taken care of. And I'm not saying it's, it doesn't require faith and trust, but God again works on our behalf, but he's not done. Verse five says, afterwards, you will come to the hill of God where the Philistine garrison is. And it shall be as soon as you have come there to the city that you'll meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with harp, tambor tambourine, flute. Verse six, go six goes on and says, then the spirit of the Lord will come upon you mightily and you shall prophesy with them and get this, be changed into another man. This is where God is providing spiritually. You know, God will, when he calls you to do something, he will give you an anointing to do that. That's what Samuel is receiving here. It says that God changed him into a new man because he has a new and very significant in this uh, situation, a very uh, significant position for Saul to step into. You know, I've talked to friends who have kids that have special needs and they talk about having a special anointing or measure of grace to love the way Jesus has called them to, to love their kid. This is what's happening here. God is providing, taking care of his business, taking care of his daily needs and giving him an anointing, a special calling and, and ability to do what God wants him to do. But here comes the challenge, verse eight. Saul, Samuel says to Saul, you shall wait seven days until I come to you and show you what to do. Seven days 
doesn't seem like that long of a time, but we've all had times when we have great experiences with the Lord and then the very next day are not responding to those experiences the way God deserves and, and the experience warrants. So let's see what happens here for Saul. We're going to read ahead. It says that Samuel gathers everyone together. And in verse 17, it, it says, Samuel called the people together to the Lord at Mizpah, and he said to the sons of Israel, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I brought Israel up from Egypt. I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the power of all the kingdoms that were oppressing you. But you have today rejected your God, who delivers you from all your calamities and your distresses. Yet you have said, No, but set a king over us. Now, therefore, present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your clans. Samuel's not mincing words here. He's not sugarcoating anything. God was called to be their king. That was plan A and a very distant plan B because whatever God has for us, anything else is very distant. But very distant is this idea of them having a human king. But that's what they called for. That's what they wanted and begged for. So, so God often will give us what we want so we can understand that his ways are better. And that's what's happening here. So they, they cast lots, which is a, a way of picking straws. Uh, I'm, I'm minimizing it for the sake of time, but it takes human bias out of it. And it lets the Lord really have a say in who gets picked. So they, they cast lots and Saul, the son of Kish, is taken. Well, they're looking around, they're calling out Saul's name, and he's nowhere to be found. He knows what's going on, and they end up finding him hiding in baggage. It says in verse 22, um, so the Lord said, the Lord had to like be the really good hide-and-seek player and, and figure out where Saul was. The Lord says, behold, he is hiding himself by the baggage. Verse 23, so they ran and took him from there. And when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. Samuel said to all the people, do you see him who the Lord has chosen? Surely there is no one like him among all the people. So all the people shouted and said, long live the king. See, Saul was hiding in baggage. He was already dealing with a lot of insecurity. He wasn't sure of what God had called him to do. And we see that this is going to continue showing up in his life. And in fact, this chapter ends in verse 27. The Bible says, But certain worthless men said, How can this one deliver us? And they, they despised him and did not bring Saul any presents. But Saul kept silent. It's interesting the Bible calls these guys who don't trust God, don't believe in what God has chosen and decided to do, the Bible calls them worthless. And yet Saul hears their words and he keeps silent, but we know that he receives them. Again, his insecurity is something that is going to continue coming up throughout his story. It's important for us to not let something that God considers inconsequential or worthless becomes significant to us. We have a choice. Are we going to walk in the fear of the Lord, which brings blessing, or the fear of man, which we're going to see in Saul's life, brings destruction? I hope you're blessed, Foothills.